Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. We got new election results last night. And I got to say, in the clear light of day, 24 hours later, one thing is clearer than it has ever been. We are right now, as I speak to you tonight, in a whole new world politically. What the future will bring, how the November midterm elections will unfold 76 days from now, is obviously unknown. It's in the future. But if you're trying to figure out what, what the expectation is, it is basically a jump ball now. It's a 50-50 it's a proposition right now. And I am shocked to find myself saying that. I mean, truly, just a few months ago, it did not seem like that would be the case. And, and there were a number of obvious reasons why. Of course, first, there are the structural factors. In modern politics, it's a truism. The incumbent party loses seats during the midterm elections. It dates back to the FDR administration, if not longer. It's a reality of our system of government, like political gravity. The Democrats start off as underdogs. Then they had to contend with a string of really bad luck, a part of it just the end of the pandemic's worst phase and the getting back to normal. There were lingering supply chain issues from the pandemic, led to concerns over empty store shelves, including that very well-documented and very scary baby formula shortage. And those supply chain issues were also one factor in record high inflation, which, again, was afflicting basically every country across the world. But, you know, you can't tell voters, well, everyone's in the same boat. It, it really did seem poised to be the single undoing of the Biden administration. And part of that inflation were the enormously high gas prices, another issue for incumbent Democrats. Republicans, again, this is a political layup, taking every opportunity to talk about the price of the pump and how is the Democrats' fault. Of course, part of the reason gas prices were so high is the Biden administration was trying to contend with the largest land war in Europe since World War II, which was dominating headlines, the six-month anniversary of which is today, as well as a seemingly total collapse of all of President Biden's major legislative domestic goals in Congress. And all of that together led to historic lows in President Biden's approval rating. I mean, in the 30s, worse than Donald Trump was at the same point in the presidency. A majority of Americans, huge majority, saying the country is on the wrong track. Just an endless sense. I, I mean, really felt this way. Things would never really go back to normal. People were, and I think rightly predicting, an absolute catastrophe, a bloodbath for Democrats in the midterms, possibly in line with the 2010 uh, midterms when reactionary backlash to President Obama and the Affordable Care Act led to Democrats an absolutely ruinous election, where they lost 63 House seats in the House, six in the Senate, and many state houses that they may not recover for a generation. But then, as summer started, just a few months ago, things changed. The first real evidence we got of this change, this pivot, this new trajectory that we're on, wasn't really so much in polling, though that started to change too, and I still have a hard time trusting it too much, but it was in actual special elections where real voters are showing up to cast actual votes. These races, these special elections, they normally take place outside usual election days to replace sudden vacancies, right? They're generally a pretty good bellwether for where the country is headed. A good example, one of the most infamous, is back in 2010. Remember when Republican Scott Brown kind of shocked the world, defeating Democrat Martha Coakley by nearly five points in the special election to replace the late Senator Ted Kennedy in deep blue Massachusetts. Ted Kennedy passed away, and that guy won the seat. That defeat was ominous, and it foreshadowed the party's very grim prospects 10 months later. So if Democrats were in that same position as Democrats were in the end of 2009, or they were in summer of 2010, if they were cruising towards a historic November blowout, you would expect Republicans to be significantly overperforming in these special election races. But the thing is, they are not. The first clue we got of this was back in June when there was a special election to replace Nebraska Republican Congressman Jeff Fortenberry. Now, Fortenberry resigned from Congress after he was convicted of three felony counts of lying to the FBI about foreign campaign contributions. The Republican running to replace Fortenberry won that special election. But the margin was much closer than anyone expected. A guy named Mike Flood won Nebraska's first congressional district, but he only won it by six points in June of this year. Donald Trump won that same district by 15 points in 2020. Fortenberry won the seat by 22 points in the same election cycle. That was number one. Number two, we saw something similar in this month's Minnesota special election to replace late Congressman, Republican Congressman Jim Hagedorn. 
Now, the Republican, again, won the seat. It's a Republican seat. Republican Brad Finstead won the seat. Finstead won by four points, which about matches Hagedorn's latest margin. Trump won the district by 10 points in 2020. Again, that those numbers there where you're winning by six points less than Donald Trump, where you're winning by the same margin as the guy who held the seat, th those are not the kind of results that you see in a red wave year. In a, in a red wave year, in a 2010 year, in a 1994 year, in that environment, you might see Republican candidates rack up double-digit margins of victory. Instead, Democrats are the ones who've been overperforming. And that brings us to last night's special elections in New York. Politics junkies were really looking at these two races because they are their own kind of bellwether. So first, there was the race in New York's 23rd district to replace former Congressman Tom Reed. We've had him on the program. He resigned after a lobbyist accused him of touching her inappropriately without her consent. In 2020, Trump won the district by 11. Reid won it by 17. Last night, the Republican candidate did 10 points worse, winning by about seven points. Again, that's four points off Donald Trump's performance in 2020. The real marquee race last night was on New York's 19th district to fill the seat vacated by Democrat Antonio Delgado when he became New York's lieutenant governor. He was appointed to be the lieutenant governor when the previous lieutenant governor was indicted. Now, the 19th is a swingy rural district. Perfect case study for this theory, right? It's one of those districts that Obama had won and then Donald Trump won the district by six points back in 2016. Joe Biden, four years later, narrowly flipped it back in 2020 by two points. So this is a district go either way. Again, if this were 2010 or this were 2014 or 1994, this is the kind of competitive district, you know, a, a mid-August <laughs> a uh, special election, hard to get turnout, where you would expect Republican enthusiasm to drive the Republican candidate to absolutely crush it. I was expecting the Republican to win this race. Not only was that not the case, the Republican didn't win it at all. Democrat Pat Ryan won that special election. And as of now, he's basically matching Biden's margin of victory in 2020. Now, there are a lot of reasons why the tide is turning for Democrats nationally. Inflation didn't increase last month, uh, month over month for the first time in like a year. Looks like it may have peaked. Gas prices are down quite significantly for high earlier this year. And there's a lot of political science literature to suggest gas prices are one of the most important inputs in voters' decisions. And President Buck, Biden's luck seems to have shifted, partly the product of a lot of hard work by a lot of people, including the president and other staffers. Democrats found a compromise within their own party to pass that climate change bill. Today, today Joe Biden announced his long-awaited student debt forgiveness plan. We're going to talk about that later in the show. It's a big deal. But of course, the two most obvious factors that change things, right, when you look for the inflection point that change things in Democrats' favor are abortion rights and the existential threat to American democracy. Now, on abortion rights, it was, of course, the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade in June that immediately, I mean, in that moment, within days, cast millions of women in America into legal regimes of forced pregnancy that are basically unmatched almost anywhere in the world. Not surprisingly, it has led to a massive backlash and mobilization among Democrats, although not just Democrats. It's especially true for women who are registering to vote in record numbers since reproductive rights were put so explicitly on the ballot. And since Roe was overturned, we're basically at a record high for the number of Americans who identify as pro-choice. Plus, we just saw voters in deep red Kansas overwhelmingly vote in support of abortion rights when it was put to a referendum. Abortion was certainly a key factor in that victory in the 19th district, Democrat Pat Ryan's victory in New York's 19th last night. In fact, Ryan ran as unabashedly pro-choice candidate. He said explicitly his strategy nationalize a race by making it a referendum on reproductive rights. And voters told NBC News that abortion was top of mind during this race. As you were casting your ballot today, what was sort of the issue that was top of mind for you? I think just in general, um, for me being a woman personally, abortion rights are incredibly important. The first thing that pops into my mind is that Roe versus Wade thing. Uh, that just, that freaked me out. Mm. And I just thought that, you know, every, every election, Every time there's a chance to vote and to, to say something, you got to go out and say it. Those voters are not alone. Abortion is likely going to be a major issue for Democrats in November, but it is not the only issue. 
In fact, according to a new NBC News poll, abortion is not the number one issue for Americans right now. It's not inflation or the economy either, which is honestly kind of surprising. No, the number one issue, the, the, the issue that most Americans volunteer for the thing that they're most concerned about are threats to our democracy. And it makes sense. I mean, the last president attempted a coup, an unprecedented attempt to snuff out American democracy. You know it. He nearly got away with it. He's almost certainly going to run again in 2024. In the meantime, a party beholden to him has this crop of new candidates running for office in his wake who pose profound threats to our basic democratic order. Carl Palladino, famously racist, sexist New York Republican, who got himself into trouble this campaign season, not for the first time, when he publicly praised Adolf Hitler's leadership style. Laura Loomer, an ultra-fringe conspiracy theorist, anti-Muslim extremist, calls herself a proud Islamophobe, was photographed last night with outright white nationalists at her campaign party. They both ran in Republican primaries last night. And they lost, that's the good news, but by single digits. I mean, these were close races. These were competitive races. And I cannot, truly cannot overstate how unfit these two people are. These are self-disqualifying candidates. These are people that should be not within a thousand miles of the halls of power. These should be 80-20 races at best. Instead, Palladino and Loomer both earned well over 40% of the vote. So the voters in this country, part of the majority, I got to say, voters in the broad, the popular front, I like to call it, right? The pro-democracy coalition, the pro-democracy majority, those voters have every reason to continue to be freaked the heck out that the Republican Party, one of the two major parties we have, simply cannot be entrusted with the keys to our constitutional republic. And the threat to democracy, to abortion rights, to bodily autonomy, that is, it has changed the game. Just ask Democrat Pat Ryan, the winner of that special election in New York's 19th district. I think the message is when fundamental rights and freedoms are under attack, we have to stand up, we have to fight, we have to be strong and clear. And when you do that, people rally. I mean, the issues at stake, reproductive rights, abortion access, are, are fundamental rights that transcend partisanship. And we saw that in Kansas. We saw it last night here in New York. I think we're going to continue to see it. And you know, we just saw polling that the number one concern for people in this country are threats to democracy. That is real. That is visceral. And that is what I really centered this campaign about. Now, look, it's still early. And as I keep saying and have, I think, said always on this show, right? Future's unwritten. A lot can change between now and November. Lord knows what could happen. Remember, imagine being early February and thinking like you knew what was going to happen in 2020, right? But it is absolutely the case that right now, from what we know, we are an entirely new political world. 